Take it away. Good morning. So what we're going to do is I'm going to talk for a long time, which those of you who've met me before will be familiar with. And then I'm going to disappear and Max will lead some discussion without me so that there's some space to process where you don't feel like I'm breathing down your necks and because I can't hear anyone. So <sighs> good morning, good morning. It's so nice to see all of you, by the way. I had really not thought about how lovely it would be. And I'm so sad that I have to leave during the pandemic and I just like won't get to see any. I mean, I still live in the neighborhood, so I guess I could just come back. But um, it's been really lovely to be here for the last year, and I hope that it's uh, I hope that it's good for everyone and that you all are able to stay safe and rest and take care of yourselves and have actual fun and just enjoy really good things and also watch Hamilton, which is on Disney plus now. so yeah. Um, so hello friends, thank you. I'm I'm so excited to get to talk about this because this is an area that I've been doing a pretty deep dive of research into over the last, I don't know what time it is. Um, I don't know, let's say year. Um, and it's something that's under theorized. And so I have the really exciting position as a researcher to say, I know more about this topic than probably anyone in the world. And now you get to know it with me. <laughs> and I'm a big nerd, so I'm into that. So um, let's go. Uh, in the recent reboot of The Babysitter's Club, which is on Netflix, um, there's a trans character, Bailey, who's rushed to the hospital with a fever. Her babysitter, Marianne, shifts uncomfortably in her seat as medical staff ask if she's been giving him fluids and declaring, let's take a look at this little man. The camera pans to Bailey, who has long blonde hair and is wearing a glittery rainbow outfit complete with pristine white tights, big butterfly detailing, and a puffy pink coat. This is the most little girl that you could ever possibly little girl. And the doctors are saying, let's talk about him. And Marianne is really uncomfortable. She ultimately says, let's go talk about this. Takes him out into the hallway and she says, by treating Marianne, or sorry, by treating Bailey like a little boy, they're ignoring who she is. She says, you're making her feel insignificant and humiliated. And that is not gonna make her feel good or safe or calm. Netflix writer Rose Damu, who is also, she said, misgendering is traumatic. This is one of the baseline ways cisgender people can show up for trans people in their life. She's talking about being a Marianne but the conversation we have less is what about the doctors? So there's this imagination that watching this as a medical professional is a really different experience than watching this as a Marianne. Jade Ritchie, who is also a trans woman, responded, even as a full-blown adult who thought I'd be able to shrug off misgendering, after coming out, I was shocked at how bad this hits me. Your stomach drops. Internally, you plead and wonder what went wrong and you vow to do better to stop it happening again, but you don't know how. The first response that Jade received was, we don't have to coddle your mental illness. Nobody responded to that person. In the fictional world of the Babysitter's Club, clinical misgendering happens in Stony Brook, Connecticut, but not in California. Marianne's friend Stacy has explained trans identity to her and says matter-of-factly that she understands this because she's from California. We have this reputation for tolerance. And so trans people are more likely to be out here, including at very young ages. But this makes California paradoxically dangerous to trans people and particularly to trans kids. Because trans people are more likely to be out and more likely to be out at a younger age, California has the highest per capita rates of anti-trans harassment in the United States. The 2015 Trans Discrimination Survey found that Californians who were out or perceptibly transgender at some point between kindergarten and 12th grade, 76% of them had experienced verbal harassment, unreasonable discipline because of their gender, physical assault or sexual assault at school. About one in six of them 
had faced such intense discrimination that they left school entirely. While California has this trans-friendly reputation, the strongest predictor of whether a trans person will experience transphobic harassment or violence is not where they live, but whether anybody knows that they're trans. So, as you know, I'm Han Cayley. I use they, them pronouns at work. So if you were talking about me and talking about being here today, you might say I listen to their lecture or they talk a lot about trans issues. You all know me as the Neighborhood Clinic Social Work Intern, but my background is in clinical sociology with an emphasis in trans healthcare systems and social processes of institutional stigma. Basically, how do we use language and behavior to tell people that they're worthless? For the last three years, I've served as the architect of the UC Santa Barbara Health Equity Initiative, which is a program, sorry? Carry on. Oh, uh, which is a program of novel research and organizational interventions intended to reduce health disparities, particularly for trans and queer students. As part of that work, I train UCSB staff and students in UCSB's underserved medicine program. I've lectured on queer and trans healthcare delivery, mental health, sexual history taking, reproductive and sexual health, and how stories and meaning making contribute to biased decision making in underserved medicine. Before I continue, I want to acknowledge some of the assumptions, understandings, and tensions that guide my approach. It's been my experience that discussions of bias bring up a lot of feelings of discomfort. Uh, often they bring up a lot of defensiveness and guilt and sometimes can prompt resentment. I think that these feelings are really natural and that they come from a cultural context in which we're expected to be perfect. The narrative that a lot of us were raised in around bias is that bias is something you choose to have if you are evil, which means that any kind of discussion of bias raises this implicit accusation, not that you might have made a mistake that harms someone, but that you are a bad person. So if you're hearing me and you're hearing me say, have you considered that you might be transphobic and kind of awful? Um, that is not going to feel good. And that's not the thing that I'm trying to say. And also it might be the thing that you hear anyway. And so I want to say, A, this is not my understanding of how bias typically arises in healthcare settings, but also it could still raise that kind of fear and guilt. And I think that that's something that deserves to be honored um, and treated really kindly. So if you end up feeling guilty, if you feel defensive, I am not upset about that. Um, and we can hold that and we can talk through that. Um, and by we, I actually, I guess, mean Max in this case. Normally I am the person who facilitates that, but I have another meeting immediately after this. So, um, but my core assumption is that everybody at this clinic deeply and genuinely wants to provide high quality care to every single patient because that is the purpose of this clinic. Um, so I, I know that you have, chosen to really sacrifice, including sacrifice how much you get paid to work at this clinic. None of, none of you are getting paid as much as you could if you worked somewhere that was more oriented towards profit and less oriented towards serving underserved patients. So I know that that is important to you and I know that you are willing to work hard to make that happen. It's also my understanding that trans patients struggle to receive treatment that feels respectful at this clinic. I've experienced this myself as a worker and a patient, and I've heard families report problems to Santa Barbara Trans Advocacy Network and express frustrations that their complaints have not been resolved. So there's work to do. We are not alone in this. Standards of care in Santa Barbara are closer to okay for trans people than in many of our surrounding communities. This is so true that when we tried to convince Dr. Joe Olson Kennedy and Aiden Olson Kennedy to come back to Santa Barbara to train physicians, mental health providers, other medical staff, they refused. They said, you're doing better than anybody else. We need to be focusing where we're more needed. So Santa Barbara is doing much better than most of California. And within Santa Barbara, a lot of people report getting better care at neighborhood clinics than anywhere else in town. So for some people, this is uncomplicated relief. This is everything has been terrible and now I'm here and I'm great and it's awesome. For other people, this feels like being trapped in humiliation because they feel like they can't get care here and everywhere else is worse. UCSB is in a really similar position. 
UCSB is also doing much better than a lot of the alternatives. And that much better is one where a lot of people are still getting treated in ways that they find humiliating. So the best that we have is reflective of the work that we've already done and how committed we are. And there's so much left to push through and to learn and to develop. That's a complicated place to be, but I think that the best way to address that is honestly. Another thing that I really wanna acknowledge is it's difficult for me to press for health equity in the midst of a pandemic. I know that right now the risk and the workload that you are facing individually as workers and as an organization is enormous. I know that human empathy is not an infinite resource and that when people feel afraid and tired, they are least able to expand investment in others, particularly if those others feel abstract or distant. At the same time, I know that our trans patients are also facing steeply elevated risk, multiple threats of pandemic, widespread poverty, legal threat, and escalating hate crimes, and they need good care now more than they ever have. They're also stressed. They're also tired. They're also feeling more reactive. And so this is the moment at which equitable and respectful care is urgently needed. And there's an additional layer of, from the very beginning of the COVID outbreak, it was identified that trans people are likely to be at higher risk than our peers, but trans people are not identifiable in COVID records. Information about trans people is not being consistently collected and is often not collected at all. And so it is likely that more trans people are contracting COVID and more people, more trans people are dying of COVID, but there is no data available to say that that is actually happening. And there has been resistance to collecting that data that would make it possible to identify that for real. So right now it is merely a hypothesis. And even in states where our genders are legally recognized, they're often not medically recognized because um, well, because the, uh, the electronic health records do not make it easy. Um, and so when data is based on electronic health records, even people who live in states where their genders are legally affirmed are not medically affirmed. So that's complex. <laughs> trans marginalization is complex. And another dynamic in trans care is that clinical staff often feel like trans care is too complex, um, is too specialized, that, that hormone therapy, surgical transition um, are confusing or concerning. And so there's a lot of inclination to say like, I don't actually know what that stuff is. That's not really my area. Um, but in the last several years of study and advocacy, the single most important thing that I've seen as a policy that makes clinics more accessible to trans patients, not, necess not just for trans related care, but for all care, the single biggest factor in facilitating healthcare access and establishing trusting clinical relationships is using gendered language that reflects the patient's identity. It requires no special training, no hormones, no scalpels, just using the words that reflect their identity. In the very simplest terms, misgendering is when a person is categorized as the wrong gender. Most centrally, this means using the wrong pronouns or gender category words like man, woman, boy, girl, uh, misgendering also includes calling people by the wrong name, um, referring to a trans person by a previous or dead name, or referring to them by a gender slant of their proper name. So a trans woman might be called Michael instead of Michelle. Um, a trans man whose name is Aaron might receive an email that spells his name E-R-I-N because it translates it into a woman's name. It also can include nonverbal behavior that's strongly gendered in a way that conflicts with the person's gender. Um, and that can be ambiguous. So like in our cultural context in this region, it's not typical to use um, words like sweetie and honey to refer to a man um, who isn't your partner. So if a male doctor refers to a male patient as sweetie, he might feel misgendered by that. He might take that to mean this person is seeing me as a woman. It doesn't have an explicit gendered meaning, but it carries the weight of gender in that way, at least to some degree. Misgendering has only started to become a common theme in trans health research in the last decade. 
but misgendering appears in non-health related literature starting about the early 90s with some outliers before that. The term arises um, pretty organically in a number of different places and just reflects the kind of natural combination of the prefix mis with the verb form of gendering, um, which means to ascribe gender or gendered meaning to something, which was pretty widely used in feminist li literatures in the late 80s and into the 90s. The earliest example I found of misgendering, which I find really interesting um, because as stated, I'm a big nerd, um, is in a footnote in a piece of 1980s, 85 legal scholarship. So the first ever misgendered person, um, as far as I can tell, is Queen Elizabeth I, because she had uh, a cour de roi, um, which means the court of the king. And this legal scholar said, wait, she's a queen. How, how does that work? Um, it, isn't she being misgendered here? And the footnote was saying, I thought that this was an editorial error, but it turns out everyone called her this and I don't know why. And the answer is because it was controversial for her to be an unmarried queen. And by calling herself a king in legal documents, it resolved the tension of that. The first kind of more substantial use um, appears in Nerudin Farah's 1986 novel Maps, in which a misgenderer is an ethno-linguistic outsider who through errors of language and violations of sexual norms treats women as men and men as women. Rhonda Cobham's intensely influential 1992 essay, Misgendering the Nation, expands on Farah's use of the term as a central metaphor of the moral, national, and sexual threat posed by colonial interlopers. In both uses, misgendering is an error of language or culture on some level, but it also reflects and localizes expressions of macroscopic power relations of gender, nationality, and class. Both of them describe misgendering as a felt threat, something that's ambiguous, confusing, and deeply distressing. Dervla Murphy in 1990 writes a travel memoir that offers the first foundational firsthand account of being misgendered. In contrast to the fictional encounter in Maps, Murphy was misgendered herself. While traveling in Cameroon, her gender expression and behavior were so foreign to some of her contacts and their concept of womanhood that they called her Sir. Murphy describes this as being really funny at first. It was confusing, it was ridiculous, but the more it happens, the more distressing she finds it. She reflects that even when logically she benefited from being perceived as a man because being perceived as a woman traveling alone in a strange country with a young child could actually put her in a lot of danger, she is unable to tolerate it. She finds that she must assert her womanhood even when it would cost her safety and the safety of her daughter. Murphy notes that while she finds misgendering much easier to tolerate when somebody believes her to be a man simply glancing at her, upon prolonged contact, and the more that it happens, the more upsetting and unsettling it becomes. What I find fascinating about this is that generally speaking, misgendering as a harm is currently talked about as something that only applies to trans people, that there's a special psychic vulnerability in transness that makes being misgendered feel painful and that cis people could not possibly identify with that experience. But the experiences of early misgendering um, accounts show that this actually has nothing to do with being trans and that anybody who experienced this enough would find it confusing, distressing, and threatening in exactly the same ways that current trans theorists describe it. So Murphy isn't trans. None of the characters in Maps are trans. Queen Elizabeth, as far as we know, not trans. So not located in, in being trans, and in fact, really solidly located in feminist literatures and post-colonial African literature. So it's about colonialism, anti-Black power struggle, and the foreclosure of gender liberty, and particularly women's liberty, by undermining the gender legitimacy that they're experiencing. So a fun thing that I... I find delightful is the first application that I could find of the term misgendering to trans experiences was in a master's thesis by Arkel Wiley, a trans social worker who studied his trans peers experiences of hostility in social work education. They, these students accounts of misgendering were completely consistent with previous accounts. They described feeling disrespected, invalidated, distressed, distracted, unavoidably wounded in exactly the same ways that Murphy had. 
Like Murphy, they described the difficulty as scaling with repeated exposure. They found it impossible to distract themselves from the experience, even when they had decided it would be safer to tolerate it. What's clear in all of these narratives is that the experience is unsettling, confusing, and devaluing. It feels stigmatizing. It feels excluding. And the logic of the stigma is oriented to both gender and whatever narrative or power dynamic makes sense of them experiencing gender stigma. For Farah's protagonist, he, his gender is stigmatized through the lens of colonial and sexual subjugation to another man who is a cultural outsider. So his manhood is threatened because his country is being colonized. For Murphy, the stigma is outsider status as being unintelligible. Even though she has considerable power over the Cameroonians, she enjoys so much wealth. She's really exercising colonial power just even by being in these remote areas of Cameroon. But the experience of being marked as not belonging in society is having zero place that fits and makes sense of her, she finds it profoundly lonely and alienating. So she's experiencing herself through their eyes as being impossible. For cis women who experience intentional misgendering within their own cultural context, particularly there's um, some conversation currently happening on Twitter around black women being called sir as ways to stop them from speaking up for themselves. This Similarly, it, it's saying like, there is no way to be a woman and behave like this. So you need to start being a woman again, or we're going to treat you like a man. It's really similar and it feels similar. So the context is important to understanding trans responses to misgendering, but these various converging stories send a really clear message that the feeling of rejection, the social threat, the gendered stigma, ultimately has nothing to do with being trans. This is simply how it feels to be misgendered. And the more people experience it, the more powerful the stigma feels. Trans people get a lot of it, but it would do the same thing to anybody who received this kind of treatment. So we have this destabilizing experience, the social interaction that, that kind of strips away a sense of shared social reality. Then what? In 2013, Kevin McLemore undertook early empirical studies of outcomes that correlate with experiences of misgendering for trans people. McLemore actually does, experience, or does um, conceptualize this as a specifically trans phenomenon, which I disagree with, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> His two studies found that trans men and trans women are misgendered about as often as one another and genderqueer people are misgendered way more which makes a certain amount of sense because trans men and trans women um, might ultimately transition in ways that they are read as men and women in uncomplicated ways. Whereas genderqueer people and non-binary people, um, which has become a more standard term since 20, <laughs> don't have that. There isn't a default way um, for people to look at somebody and say, oh, that person's non-binary. So non-binary people get misgendered more, they're recognized less. Being misgendered more often in Macklemore's study um, correlated with weakened identity congruence and strengthened identity importance. In other words, people who experience their gender as in question socially can experience identity instability, but the identity feels more important than ever. And as you can imagine, that is just a recipe for distress. So participants who were misgendered often or who felt especially stigmatized lost a sense of authenticity in their gender. They started feeling fake and wondering if somehow they were just wrong about their gender. Building on this research, Macklemore ran a, specific, a substantially larger study a few years later, finding that misgendering was associated with anxiety, depression, stress, and felt stigma. He concludes that this is a population specific minority stress factor. I again think that it's actually less specific than, than he claims, but that's okay. Evidence about longer term impacts are still emerging, but let's just kind of imagine a patient who's in the state described with what's already known. Let's think about somebody sitting in an exam room, feeling confused, distracted, devalued, ashamed of their body, wondering if their identity is wrong. 
how many questions does this patient ask about their care plan? How well do they understand and remember instructions given about what they're supposed to do when they leave? How much do they trust their provider, which is a major factor in whether they follow those instructions? How likely is it that they'll come back for their next appointment? While the study didn't talk about misgendering specifically, the largest ever study of trans adults found that almost a third of trans people report putting off routine healthcare just out of fear that they would be treated badly by clinic staff. UCSB participants expressly attributed care avoidance to misgendering. They said outright, I get misgendered, it makes me not wanna to come to the clinic ever again, even in an emergency. Avoidance of routine care over the life course has massive implications in life expectancy. Um, in the research I just mentioned, my research at UCSB, in a group of 54 cisgender women and 33 trans spectrum people who did not indicate lacking a cervix, I know that's kind of a mouthful, but I didn't actually ask them what their assigned sex at birth was. 33% of the cis women had received pap tests as often as their provider recommended, compared with only 15% of the trans people. Timely detection of reproductive cancers is obviously a crucial determinant of survivability. So if trans people are half as likely to receive timely pap tests, they're less likely to survive cervical cancer. So in addition to things like care avoidance, enacted and felt stigma such as those prompted by misgendering, are linked to increased risk of maladaptive coping, such as problematic engagement with drugs and social isolation, um, risky sexual decisions, a wide variety of negative health outcomes, and suicidality. In the most extreme case, the distress of misgendering may directly contribute to death, such as in the case of 14-year-old Kyler Prescott. Prescott was bullied and harassed by his classmates for presenting as a boy. He started having suicidal thoughts and demonstrating self-injurious behaviors. And Kyler's mother brought him to a children's hospital where she knew that there were trans pediatric services, assuming that this meant that the entire hospital would be supportive of Kyler's gender. Over a 72 hour hospital stay, Kyler was persistently misgendered by hospital staff and patients. Um, for instance, uh, a staff member told him that she couldn't call him he him because he was she, the person said, was such a pretty girl. He was also bullied by other patients for his gender in the same way that he had been bullied by his classmates. His distress and suicidality sharply escalated and he died by suicide shortly after he was discharged. A discrimination suit sought to establish that the discriminatory care caused Kyler's death, but the federal suit was ultimately settled out of court. This leaves open questions though about how much liability there could be in cases where a patient does die by suicide after it's been established that their care was persistently misgendering. Given the very high stakes of misgendering, it is pretty worrying that there are very few studies on prevalence. Macklemore's study found that 33 to 44% of participants reported being misgendered often or always, but this was in their lives. Um, virtually all of his participants reported some frequency of misgendering. Only 7 to 10% said that they were never misgendered. But this study isn't specific to medical contexts, so that doesn't tell us about what people are experiencing in clinics. Being misgendered by providers was a recurrent theme in the 2018 Out for Mental Health study, which gathered feedback from LGBTQ adults in roundtables and town halls across California. Trans adults, parents of trans kids described misgendering as unwelcome, um, feeling ignored and disrespected when their names and pronouns were repeatedly mistaken or ignored. Um, Orange is the New Black star Laverne Cox goes even further saying, I've been saying for years that misgendering a trans person is an act of violence. But last year, I found that 44% of trans students at UCSB said medical staff called them their own name some or all of the time. And 63% of trans students said medical staff sometimes or always called them by the wrong pronoun. Of course, some errors are inevitable. We've all called the teacher mom, but only 9% of cisgender students had been addressed by the wrong name and only 5% had been addressed by the wrong pronoun. So there's a huge gap 
And I think this rate among cisgender students offers a, a reasonable and non-perfectionist goal um, to try to get down to, that that is a level that is tolerable for people. Um, anyone can be misgendered occasionally and shrug it off, but it's the pervasiveness that makes it risky. An additional risk with misgendering, as with any stigmatizing language, is the associated risk, uh, or the, rather the risk associated with correction. If a person feels stigmatized, it's very vulnerable to identify their experience of stigma to the person who enacted it. In the best case, it creates an opportunity for repair and helps the relationship strengthen. But if the repair doesn't occur, it can create an opportunity for more stigmatization. As I suspect probably most of us in the room have experienced, naming stigma up a hierarchy can invite defensiveness, resentment, and punishment rather than care and repair. This can lead patients to simply put up with misgendering and conclude that our, ho our clinic is hostile to them or that we are hostile to them individually. This really naturally will correspond with the care avoidance I described. And that is really the worst case for a clinic. And the really worst case is somebody who concludes this clinic is hostile to trans people and tells their friends. And so lots of people hear that this is hostile to trans people. And I think that that is starting to happen because parents of trans kids came to Espitan and said, we can't get this fixed. I don't know if it's a mistake anymore. So what can we do? We have a harmful, pervasive behavior. We will generally not notice it as we do it because it is a mistake of, mis of misunderstanding. And patients will be fearful to let us know about it. So there's four basic elements to the strategy. First, we can reduce the risk of misgendering through consistent use of pronoun checking as a universal precaution. We do not know who we might misgender and we cannot know how many times they've been exposed to the deleterious effects of misgendering prior to this encounter. By the nature of misgendering, we'll almost never experience felt uncertainty, we'll simply guess wrong. So universal precautions are the only option. This means when we introduce ourselves to every single patient. Hi, I'm Han, I use they, them pronouns what name and pronouns should I use for you? It's modeling and cueing. Is the person wearing a badge with their pronouns on it? Those are the pronouns to use. Does the person have pronouns listed in their chart? Those are the pronouns to use. If we don't check, we can't know and we won't know who we're guessing wrong with. But if the person has been guessed wrong with many times, it can hurt them a lot. The second part is we can be mirrors to one another. We can reflexively use the correct language. If anyone is addressed by the wrong name or pronoun in your presence, use the correct name or pronoun yourself immediately. It is appropriate to interrupt with the correct pronoun or name. Do it where the misgendered person can see or hear it. This helps the person who's made a mistake recognize their error immediately, which cognitively means they're more likely to learn from it. And it also makes the span of time during which the misgendered person feels alone and possibly humiliated as short as possible. Think about this as an emergent situation. It must be handled immediately. And among other things, before it's handled, the patient will be so distracted from whatever's being said to them that it would need to be repeated anyway. So that has to happen first. The next piece is practice impeccable repair by thinking intentionally about what correction is. I wanna say Max is an amazing resource for your team on impeccable repair. Max is great at this and she's great at it on purpose. Learn from her about how to do it. <laughs> correction is frequently necessary because aside from intentional misgendering, most of these occasions arise from misreadings. I have an experience going on, which means that people who misgender patients and staff don't know that they're doing it. They are misreading the person, which means they can't know that they're making a mistake without somebody else pointing it out to them. So we need each other to be mirrors to know that we're messing up. 
That means we won't know unless the misgendered person displays woundedness, which is relatively rare, or an, onlar an onlooker lets us know that this mistake has occurred. At the same time, a fumbled correction can not only fail to repair the relationship, but it can actually make things worse. And part of this is because although we are deeply interested in providing good care, and we're most, we get distracted by adjudicating whether the misgendering was intentional or intentionally hostile. And so we can end up really kind of losing the point where the patient is saying, I need you to stop hurting me. And we're saying, I'm not a person who hurts people. And that's not relevant. So digging into this as an example, let's imagine that we have a patient who is a trans woman. She's presenting for care and somebody calls her sir. If she imagines that this is intentional, that the speaker recognized her as a trans woman and chose to call her sir as a pointed statement about her gender category, there's two major implications. First, that her presentation, behavior, or body is recognizably trans and thus irreconcilable with her womanhood. That her presentation, her behavior, her body is unacceptable. Her gender is deviant. This corresponds really closely with the early feminist uses of misgendering and with current discussions happening about cisgender black women who are called sir. Misogynist and trans misogynist discourses often really cite a rhetorical penis for women like this. Um, you may have seen people claiming that Michelle Obama has a, pe a penis and it is not meant to be a literal claim about the reality of her body. It is a claim about the illegitimacy of womanhood for a black woman who has been a high powered lawyer and the first lady of the United States. The second major implication when she perceives misgendering to be intentionally hostile is that she is not owed civility. She's not owed respect in the context that her gender is so devalued that the speaker can unhesitatingly humiliate her without fear of censure. In this case, the more professional the environment is, and a care environment particularly, can sharply emphasize this message. A close friend of mine has a trans daughter, and she and her daughter was, or were visiting her hospital, or visiting her husband in the hospital after a surgery. As they walked through the hallway, a passing hospital employee made a transphobic remark at full volume directed at her daughter. This kind of behavior is really stigmatizing because there's no universe in which a hospital employee of any kind should feel confident openly devaluing a person based on their gender. That should not be professionally tolerated. No medical staff should feel comfortable engaging in that behavior, but he did feel comfortable. And he was right to in the sense that he did not bear any cost for that behavior. It was tolerated and he knew it was gonna be. And that sends the message to that family. We don't have to treat people like her, like people. In addition to being deviant, her gender is devalued. She is beneath the protection of society, but that's intentional misgender. What happens if she interprets it as unintentional? So a trans woman who's called sir by someone who she perceives to be friendly to trans people must not have noticed that she was a woman, must have looked at her and genuinely thought she was a man and wanted to show her respect as a man. In other words, her presentation, her behavior, her body are unrecognizable as a woman's. The more she tried to be recognized as a woman then, the more she will feel like an abject personal failure. A person who feels like her gender is being marked as deviant or worthless might speak up if she feels empowered to demand better treatment. A person who feels that her gender is being misunderstood might offer clarification. This is the difference between, it's not okay to talk to me like that, or I wanna to talk to your manager, versus actually it's ma'am. And the difference with such a wounding concept may be merely tone. It may not even be recognizable. So you might not even be able to recognize whether the person is reading you as intentionally or unintentionally misgendering them if they give you feedback. Trans people who have offered clarification often receive evidence that even if the in initial misgendering was an error, their, their gender is additionally deviant and devalued. Many trans people will choose not to be visible 
rather than encountering messages that are devaluing. A parallel that I wanna draw here is that there are many, many people of color in the United States who choose to tolerate colleagues mispronouncing their names, even though it feels disrespectful. I have so many colleagues and have had so many colleagues who tell me I've worked here for 10 years and people still don't know what my name is. They choose to tolerate it because it maintains the interpretation that it's a mistake. If they correct, it risks a bigger relational problem, which is receiving the message that it wasn't a mistake and that there's no plan to fix it. But the mispronunciation, this constant little devaluing is a barrier to the relationship. It is difficult for anyone or impossible to feel valued and understood by somebody who calls you the wrong name. In any situation, ideal correction is one where one person says, hey, actually that hurts me. And the other person responds, I have no idea. I won't do it again. Correction can instead be devaluing when a person doesn't take the harm seriously, doesn't apologize, or doesn't stop the harmful behavior. Because trans people are already devalued, many well-meaning responses accidentally use frame frameworks that include devaluing and othering messages. Um, I've included an exercise called Assessing Implicit Messages, which encourages you to think about several different responses trans people often get to clarifications about their gender. Think about how these well-intentioned responses might feel to somebody who's in a position of saying, hey, you're getting my identity wrong and hearing these back. That experience may or may not be familiar to you, but hopefully this puts you in a position of getting to see how this feels for others. And um, I ran out of time in setting this up, but if you wait on that exercise until like after lunch, um, it'll reflect back to you what trans people said when they took the same quiz. So um, there is a link available, Max has it, but do it after lunch. Um, <clears throat> so that leads me to the final strategy, and then I will stop talking. Um, and the final strategy is encourage and reward feedback. When a patient says, hey, you're getting my gender identity wrong, um, the very best response is sorry and immediately use the name or pronoun that they corrected to. This confirms that they're valuable, that they're a legitimate human being. It rewards the feedback. It encourages them to continue giving you feedback about the relationship, and it restores normalcy very quickly. Because this experience is destabilizing and often felt to be humiliating, you don't want to stay in it. You want to get out of it as fast as possible with repair. So while rejecting messages are really common, um, another really common mistake is to err on the side of like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I really take this seriously. I'm, I'm just, um, I've, I've made a mistake. And listen, I care a lot about that. And like, it feels like that is honoring how much it, it matters, but there's a balance. Um, and the ideal balance is fix quickly and then use it correctly after that. So another way of encouraging feedback is when a colleague or the support person of a trans patient, because a lot of trans patients will bring somebody for the purpose of correcting. Um, if that person corrects you and says, actually, this is the person's name, actually, this is the pronoun as you're speaking, say thank you and immediately use that name or pronoun. So um, if I say, oh, I had a patient who came in and she was, and Max goes, oh, they, I'll go, thank you. They were talking about their uh, concerns at work. It's in line, it's very fast, and it positively rewards the feedback. And that gives Max the message, I'm not mad at you for correcting me. I know that corrections can be uncomfortable, but like, it's fine, I value this. So practice thinking about feedback as a shared commitment to patient safety. We need mirrors to see our own behavior, especially the behavior that might be a mistake and a mistake of misinterpretation. We don't see what we've forgotten. We don't see what we've misread. So we only see that through the gift of reflection of our colleagues. One of the really powerful benefits of this particular clinic is that y'all love each other. Like you clearly love each other. You have these deep, committed, and long-term relationships with each other, this beautiful culture. And that is a really strong foundation to build accountability that works better. 
because you know that if you let each other know, hey, this actually is a mistake. Actually, you're not doing the thing um, that I think we really need to be doing. You can trust each other that that's not tearing each other down. That's not an attack. That that is pulling each other back into the shared goal of serving patients and helping sit with that embarrassment. Side note, with the embarrassment, it is so, so common, particularly if you've been working, particularly if you do care a lot about trans patients, that if you misgender people, you feel embarrassed and you really wanna talk about it and you should talk about it with each other. Don't talk about it with the patient because it's awkward. It's awkward for them. It just expands this humiliation. Um, but do talk about it, sit with, sit with somebody, sit with, Max, sit with the person that you're charting with and say, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I misgendered this patient three times and there's no reason for me to misgender this patient. What am I doing? But don't do it with the patient because it feels so bad for the patient. But like, do it, it's fine. It's fine to feel embarrassed. It is so safe to feel embarrassed. But reorient, the embarrassment is not the big harm. The embarrassment is a side note of a mistake. We're all human. We all make mistakes. We all feel embarrassed. The important thing is our patients feel safe when they come see us. They feel like we care about their safety. So everybody will make mistakes and a network of noticing and feedback will make those potentially very harmful mistakes less catastrophic and less common. It's a gift to the patient. It's a gift to you. I have included, I know I've talked so much longer than I intended and I appreciate all of your patience. I'm gonna go, cause I have to go to a meeting half an hour ago. Um, but Max has lots and lots and lots of treats. It was delightful to get to share this with you. Um, you're all doing really amazing work and uh, take it away, Max. Goodbye, friends. Bye, Han. Bye, Han. That was a wonderful presentation.